A lot of projects do have oxides. This has, you know, 50 plus million tons of oxides. One of the biggest mining private equity funds in the world, uh, resource capital funds, came in, they did 10 weeks of due diligence on site, on the ground. They saw what I saw. They put $35 million in and subsequently put more in. Make sure you can do things. Don't promise people something you can't do. Do it. Hello and welcome to Crux Investor. First of all, thanks so much for watching this video. If you like it, do give us a thumbs up. It really would be appreciated. And of course, leave your comments below. Help us understand the questions you'd like us to be asking, what you think of our performance, and of course, what you think of the company. And if you want to catch this as a podcast, read about it, or read the transcript, you can get that on cruxinvestor.com. And of course, for our Crux Club members, you get early access. If you haven't already done so, please click the button in the corner of the screen to subscribe to our YouTube channel. And of course, for more videos like this, click the notification bell. We spoke earlier today to Paddy Downey. He's the CEO of Orzone Gold, a TSXV listed uh, gold developer there in Burkina Faso in West Africa. Really like this project. Uh, it's they're in the final stages um, of the development in that they've got a harmonized uh, term sheet from banks for the build, 160 million capex, uh, IRR about over 60%, uh, NPV5 of about 520 million bucks at 1500 bucks gold. Really nice numbers. Also quite like their local community initiatives, uh, definitely worth looking out for. So we talk about their business plan, how they hope to move things forward through and post uh, COVID, uh, how quickly they'll be able to get into action, what's happening in West Africa and all of the other producers around them uh, in terms of how they've been affected by COVID and also local terrorist activity. Lots discussed, take a look at the description below. Anything interests you in particular, click on the number, that's a timestamp and that will jump you to that part of the video. But enjoy what Paddy has to say. Paddy, how are you doing, sir? Very well, how are you? Not bad, all hold up here. Um, what about you? Where are you? Vancouver, I guess? I'm in, uh, I'm in Vancouver, Canada. So, um, you know, obviously we're all over the place. We've got uh, people in Vancouver, people, uh, a couple of small offices in Ottawa, and then obviously Burkina Faso, and then some of our guys who were on site are now back at home in South Africa and other places. Who'd have thought it's June? Who'd have thought? We're still here. Mm -hmm. Hopefully we'll, we'll be allowed out soon. Um, well, look, Paddy, why don't we kick off with that usual one minute summary um, for people new to this story, then we can pick it up from there. Well, uh, Orzone, we're developing the Bombore project in Burkina Faso. It, it is a shovel ready project. It's quite a simple project. Um, first part of it is oxide, all free dig, you know, no drill and blast, no crushing, very little grinding. So, you know, low cost, low power cost, low reagent cost. We're developing it in stages. So we build the oxide first, and then in year three, we start the sulfide. We build it all out of cash flow. So it's something that a junior company like uh, Orzone can do. So we've been very conscious about making that type of move. We've completed our feasibility studies. We've um, negotiated all our debt. In fact, we've got a harmonized term sheet now to, to move forward with the debt. Initial capital cost is about 155 million. Uh, all in would be around 200, which would include working capital and, and corporate GNA and local GNA, et cetera. The debt would be around 140. Uh, we have raised 20 recently, um, which was going directly towards the project. Uh, so we would expect uh, you know, another 30 million of equity and uh, once the debt's in place and we're ready to move. Um, obviously COVID has affected that. You can't really and uh, move people in and out and move equipment in and out during construction. But that's no different than anybody else around the world in regards to a construction project. But we are ready to go. We produce about 140,000 ounces a year for 10 years and then about another 80 or 90 for the next uh, three, four years. And we're wide open in expiration. We, it, it is really a, um, a project that I think would be going for many, many, many years. A great location in Burkina, uh, very safe, right in the center of it. An example of that would be uh, West African Resources. They're about 15 kilometers from our project. Uh, they built their project last year. Uh, they built it in 12 months, which is uh, something that people should recognize how quickly and how efficiently things get built in Burkina. And it ramped up to nameplate uh, uh, throughput in a month. And um, again, that's something very common in Burkina in terms of developing mines. And they're right beside us. They're up and running right now. A very successful project. We hope to be the next one uh, there in the next uh, year or two. Okay, good man. Th thanks for running through that, Paddy. Now we've spoken a couple of times before, so you know, some of our folks have heard 
uh, you talk about the story and take it through. But there's that we've since we've last spoke, which is July, would you believe, nearly a year. Um, wow. We, I know. Uh, so, we, we, you know, we've grown a bit. We've got a few more new listeners. So just for those new people, I want to kind of go through the kind of thinking, you know, how you got to where you are today, because you had effectively retired early and you were dragged back into this from memory. So what yeah, what happened dragged. and what were you thinking? <laughs> I wasn't dragged. Uh, look, um, I was on the board of, of this company. I was on the board of several other companies that have been successfully um, either been been uh, purchased, Claude or, or Dalradian. Uh, Victoria has been built in a, now a very successful operation. And so, um, you know, Arizona had got itself into a, you know, a bit of a tangle with resources and its development plans. It was a very complicated development story. You know, um, I stepped into it, uh, spent a lot of time looking at what it was. I'm a technical, from a technical background, I brought in a number of people that I trust to do a review with me, alongside me to say, look, Here's how I think this can work. And really what it boiled down to was, this is a sort of a unique project. Um, a lot of projects do have oxides. This has, you know, 50 plus million tons of oxides. And oxides are very cheap to work with. You know, they're, they're shallow. We're, our average pit depth is 45 meters. They're free digs, so you don't have to drill and blast, no explosives, you know, um, very low wear and tear on the equipment. So you're not replacing mining fleet early. So it's, you know, cheaper mining. You don't have to crush it to so no crusher up front. We only have to grind 20% of it. So we saw a real opportunity here. If we step back, looked at the oxides, it's a cheaper development plan. Uh, the sulfides are there. there. There's a very, very large sulfide um, uh, deposit here. There's, you know, four plus million tons of M and I. Now it's in and around a gram, but today that would be absolutely churning out cash if it was built but we looked at it and said look we can leave that to later there's higher grade sulfides that we see we can add those on later on uh, but we we focus on the development at that time people started to take an interest in it um, when i came on board and uh, one of the biggest you know uh, mining um, uh, private equity funds in the world uh, resource capital funds uh, you know contacted me you know there was a number of others but we went with rcf uh, they uh, they came in they did 10 weeks of due diligence on site on the ground uh, they saw what i saw they put 35 million dollars in and sub subsequently put more in very very supportive shareholder and um, we've also got some of the larger mining funds as shareholders you know the the, the, the equity funds in the us and in, and elsewhere in 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 the uk so we we we, we put that feasibility out in 2018. We then started to look at the sulfides. Uh, we were doing debt negotiations at that time, but early stage, the sulfides started to look way better than we thought. And um, so we, we had a lot more higher grade than we thought. Um, we've only brought them down to 95 meter pit depth. So not deep, uh, not expensive. And we negotiated with the banks that we could ring fence uh, cash flow from the oxides in year one and two to build the sulfides. And that's very difficult to do. I mean, banks don't like risk. They don't like to to allow money to be to be swept out for other things except paying them back. But they saw the upside as well. And so we just recently signed a harmonized term sheet on that. We issued that feasibility study in 2019. It added, you know, I think $120 million of NAV. It added another three years of mine life. It, uh, you know, it, it improved the production profile from an average of 90,000 ounces a year in the first 10 years to 135. So e extremely positive uh, add on, but we see more sulfide. So we've designed that sulfide plant so it can be expanded once it's up. It means that we can build it. It's, it's of a capital cost that the banks are comfortable with. They won't have to worry about their cash sweeps. But if we get it up and built and it runs well, we're very, very confident that we will expand that further. So you will see a, a second expansion on top of this. And that's unique about uh, Bombori. It is a project that you can do that with and you can you can become a 200,000 ounce a year producer internally without having to spend or, or you really mortgage the company in terms of debt or equity. 
Okay, so, so let me. So you come very quickly through how you join in, into what you've got today, but I'm trying to work out the, what the management team. What's in your head? What's the management team um, want to do here? You know, I'm trying to understand the model a little bit because people like to buy into the management team. You know, you know what they bought. So what yeah. we see here is that you have evolved this into well, you know, effectively permitted and shovel shovel ready and. Um, you know, the numbers look good that, that we've, we've looked at, the A6, you know, what, around 670 or something like that, 672, I think. That's right. You know, um, low, low CapEx project. But you guys have got one project, one project only. Um, that's, is that all you're going to do? What, what are your ambitions here? No, well, I mean, you have to start off with one project, obviously. Yeah. Uh, building two would be, you know, unless you've got, you know, endless uh, sources of capital. But... Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, I've done this many times. Sometimes it's happened that I've, you know, somebody has stepped in and, and paid paid the right price for it. And we as shareholders, and that's one thing that people should understand, management and, and board here, we own, you know, 5.4% uh, of this company and we bought it on the market and we continue to buy on the market. I continue to buy this week on the market. Um, and um so we're there with the with the shareholders. We we want to see you know the the proper uh, net asset value per share. You know we're not here for our wages or our change of control, but at the end of the day, you have to put a team together that can build the project, and we have that team, and you know we're very comfortable doing that for the simple reason we look at the value proposition for us and our shareholders. Take for example West African beside us. They they were trading around twenty. 324 cents at the beginning of 2019 made the decision to build the project got the debt in place built the project and now they're 90 cents you know so you, you know you see the value that can be done they're the same if you look at what happened recently in in burkina with um taranga taranga sort of sat around four dollars forever you know as with one project in in uh, senegal they took on this second project they built it on time they built it under budget in Burkina, now they're a ten dollar stock. You know, uh, Roxco would be the same if you looked at where they went from where they started the project to where they built it. So we see that value for our shareholders in building this project. If we build that, of course we look for the next project because a single asset company is not what you want to be. Whether we merge with somebody else, whether we find another project, we don't know at this stage. We're looking around, but. At this point in time, our focus is building this and building it right. Okay, great. You, you've been through a few other people's business models there, and you're saying you're open to all of the above. But um, what I'm trying to get at, and what I want, I think people want to see is, is to understand what, what's the current thinking for you. Clearly, you've got to get this thing over the line. You're, you're, you, you took about 95. percent you, You've you kind of built. You're, you're moving villages. You've, you've got the whole logistics thing sorted down. You've built roads. You've you know, you get, you're very good at that. You're, you're very technical. We're, I've looked at the team and you've talked that language and the presentation is that. So you're very good at getting things done. And you're, and you're nearly, well, effectively, you've got har harmonized term sheets on the table, which is great. So, but where, what is the model you're going to employ moving forward? Because you look at Rock's goal, they got into early production on a low life of mine, high grade project, and that set them up the, for the cash flow to buy their second asset. And you, you, know, you talk about, you know some of some of the other people around you. They've all, all played slightly different models. But what what's yours? What's yours going to be? You know, are you say we're going to stay in West Africa? So that's what that's what we know. That's what we do. But your track record yeah, suggests yeah. you could I, do more. Yeah, no, no. I, I think we will. You know, obviously we're going to stay in West Africa. That's uh, I think it. You know, one thing. It's a great place to build a project in the sense of capital uh, control and operating excellence. I mean. People talk about risk and I say, you know, well, you know, the risk in West Africa is obviously there. You know, I mean, there's obviously risk anywhere. But I say to them, look, can you name me five projects in Canada that you know, were permitted on time, built on budget, uh, operated according to the flow sheet, you know, uh, ramped up to production within a month and then, you know, started to pay back free cash flow to the shareholders and nobody can name any. And I name, you know seven or eight right off the bat, which includes Yaramoko of Rocks Gold, which includes Hyundai, Itty, uh, Bungu, Toro, you know, uh, most recently now, uh, um, uh, the uh, West African project right beside us, San Brado. 
and then Taranga uh, to the south of us, and then you look at Perseus as well. So very, very successful, you know, build operate. So the model is there for us to do that. Now, should there be consolidation in West Africa? Absolutely, and it's happening right now. You see it happening. And most recently you saw um, our neighbor, uh, West Africa, and they brought a, bought a project from B2, which is called Tawega. Uh, you know, it's equidistant from both ourselves and them to the south. Um, so, and it's a re really, really nice add on for them in terms of uh, sulfides. It, it's a smaller project. It would never be a standalone. You know, if you look at ourselves and Sambrado together with Tuega, there's 10 million ounces of MI. If that was in, in uh, Nevada, there'd be, there'd be a, a staking rush. Okay. You know, um, but give, so but there's, give, there's obvious opportunity right there. Th there is. But I wanna, what, what I'm trying to get from you is are you the acquirer or the acquirer E? I, I, to be honest with you, that's never been it's something that I worry about. I've been both. All I worry about is getting the right uh, uh, mix of assets put together so there's value for the shareholders. What you hate is shareholder destruction when you do a, 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 an acquisition or a merger. You, you should never do it for the sake of doing it. You should do it because it's a meaningful transaction to do and it makes sense for everybody in the, in the, uh, in the, in, in the room. I'll give an example. Uh, recently, I was heavily involved in it was um, uh, Claude. Claude was a broken down story, a, a, a terrible management. Um, you know, it never made money. Uh, a group of us changed the board, management changed, we stepped in, um, turned it around, but we were still a single asset company and um, with a bad track record. But now we're getting it going. We did a merger with, 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 with part of SSR Mining and look where that has gone in the three years since we've done that merger. A huge success for everybody. So that's what you look for. Whether I'm running it or not, I don't care as long as the guy running it is the right guy with the right board. That's what I care about. It. And it's the right mix of assets. So long term, everybody's uh, doing it. And, you know, social issues are the worst destruction of value when it comes to uh, m and transactions where people start arguing about I want to be the guy, I want to be the person, whatever. No, I, I look at it and go, does this make sense for the shareholders? Because I'm generally a big shareholder. Okay, understood. I guess we should wait and see what opportunities arise, but it does make yes. sense for consolidation in the region. There's a lot of yes. players, a lot of players who perhaps don't have the cash that they need to move things along as well in, in, in an area which is, I think, reasonably well understood in terms, in terms of the um, ore bodies, et cetera. And let me ask you about something you touched on there, which was uh, effectively security. People's perception of West Africa at the moment, certainly the, the, the Mali, the Niger border, Burkina Faso border, um, and several others, people talking about these sort of terror, terrorist type incursions and the effect. And obviously we saw that what happened with Semaphore towards the end of last year very unfortunate set of events. So it's a heightened awareness. Um, we saw a bit of a reaction from shareholders, but I think generally every, most companies have kind of pulled, pulled back, and I think some of them pulled back for the, well, before the um, consolidation there. How is it actually operating in the region? Are you being affected? Are you having to take additional measures? Well, look, we're not, we have not been affected. Obviously, we're in a, a region of... Um of Burkina that is extremely safe and secure. We're, we're 90 kilometers from the capital. We're on a main highway. We have a, a you know, a, a, a significant military presence beside us. Having said that, look, yes, obviously it has been noise and it has affected, you know, some people's perception of, of it. But I think since the beginning of the year when uh, France recommitted their, their uh, forces to the area, there's a lot more now cooperation between the, all of the countries uh, in terms of their security and their security communication and, and intelligence sharing that um, we've seen a fairly significant pushback in, in, in that regard. Will there continue to be um, uh, these attacks on, on innocent villagers? Probably. Um, but um, you know, and a lot of that's down to keeping a smuggling uh, corridor open. You know, the, the, these guys links down to the ports up the east of Burkina, up the north of Burkina, into the north of Mali, and then into the Sahara. They, they, that, that's going to continue because they're smuggling all sorts of things up that corridor. And that's been going on for many, many, many years, long before 
the, the, the terrorism. The terrorism really started when, when Gaddafi's, you know, um, fell in, in Libya. He was controlling it before that. Um, the mines themselves have not seen interruptions. Their supply chain has been very secure. The mines themselves have got, you know, high, high quality and high level security. So um, we don't expect to see that. I think the vote of confidence was uh, around that was uh, Endeavour, uh, you know, purchasing a uh, semifo and now they've, they've uh, brought that into the Endeavour fold, into the Endeavour management system. We were very happy to see that. And during all of this, I, I want to emphasize two mines were built. So you had, you know, Wanyon down in the south with uh, Taranga built during all of this time and commissioned and running. And then West African right beside us, San Prado, you know, built. So things continued as normal. And so operations, uh, you know, et cetera, all continue as, as, as normal. So and I, I think that will continue to be the case for, for the foreseeable future. Okay, so look, you, you, you guys are shovel ready, um, but you're interrupted by this thing called COVID-19, mm -hmm. the coronavirus, uh, which has affected a lot, of, a lot of companies. You're in the process of pretty much coming towards the end of a very large logistics exercise, having sort of understood what you had under the ground, um, and obviously conversations with banks. Can you sort of tell us where you kind of got up to and when things kind of get back up and running, where people can travel? You know how far you are away from actually being able to get things over the line yeah well you know we were like every um, mine in in africa and, and particularly uh, west africa generally has a village relocation i would term ours a medium-sized one we're moving about three thousand people at this stage we um, have very strong community relations and communication with our with our uh, uh, local communities so we were building about 1,100 houses, including infrastructure, which be churches, mosques, um, uh, schools, clinics, you know, shopping areas, roads, um, all of that sort of stuff. That was 95% complete. We have seven villages that we were building. Five of them are complete. Two of them are almost complete. But in conjunction with the local community leaders, etc., at that time, COVID was, you know, really uh, uh, something that people were quite uh, scared of, particularly around Africa, and they've done a great job of uh, controlling it. So we shut it down uh, with the, with those guys, uh, you know, blessing. They wanted to move; they were ready to move, but we, everybody felt like it was the best thing to do. We had about a month of construction left to complete at that time. You know, our, our plan is to to start, uh, you know, things up again in August of this year, you know, mobilizing a, a number of the contractors, not all of them, because we don't need all of them. It would take about two months to finish that. And we now, you know, again, with the, the village uh, leaders are actually looking to move into those houses starting now. We really want to coordinate that a little bit better. So we want to make sure we have boots on the ground to do that. Uh, so we expect that to start in August and then in September, October, we will be finished that move, which will allow us, um, hopefully at that point, things have, have opened up again in terms of international travel, uh, that the borders have opened up in these countries, and then we can start moving our team back in on the ground on the for the major construction to start in the latter end of Q4. So we're coordinating it. The key thing is to make sure that everybody understands what you're doing on the ground, particularly the local communities, and keep them actively informed. One other thing we did, we have a lot of what are called livelihood restoration programs, which are market gardens, uh, weaving programs, uh, chicken farming programs. They're all continuing. And we, we made sure that they are all continuing because they are livelihoods that we are developing for those uh, communities post the move uh, as well. So that never stopped. That on ground work is done by people who are local guys that we have trained and we continue to fund and develop that during the COVID. And obviously the 20 million bucks that you raised in January, that's, well, uh, for, fortuitous timing, you know, um, mm. <laughs> you're, gonna, you're gonna claim, you're not gonna claim foresight on that one, but um, obviously- <laughs> <I wish. laughs> But it does. It obviously make, makes things a lot easier because there's this sort of um, un unknown to when things will return to normality. But so just no, I just wanted to say that you know, cash wise, you're 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 fine going on. But I was actually quite taken and quite impressed by these community initiatives. You know, people talk about CSR in a very casual way, like it's some some tick box exercise. But you've you've got 
quite a few, not even are you moving villages, you know, seven villages there, but you've talked about the way that you're, you've created these programs and initiatives to help them, you know, c you know carry on as, as normal or to learn skills which they may not have had to earn revenue and so forth. So it's, I mean, it's really, really important here, but mm -hmm. these things just don't happen overnight and you don't win hearts and minds overnight. So when, when did these kick off? Look, uh, I really want to take no credit for that. I mean, um, the team here was uh, the same team that was involved with Essacan, one of the first major mine developments in Burkina. Hmm. They moved over 10,000 people and they learned a lot from that. They learned a lot of what to do and what not to do. And when when they started on this project, uh, you know, the, uh, the VP of Exploration, Pascal Marquis, got onto this right away and put a a CSR team on the ground uh, looking at what could or couldn't be done. So these programs have developed out of um, input from the communities, what will work, what won't work. One of the key things uh, that we learned right off the bat with these communities, they were moved here in the 70s. This is not a very, very long sort of uh, hundreds of year community in place. There's two major rivers here. There was lots of tetsi fly, lots of malaria, the UN came in here in the 70s, they spread DDT, because I, I suppose you could in the day. Um, and then they plant, moved people in from other parts of Burkina and planted cotton and then left. And of course, the people, what, what do you do with cotton? Well, unless you know how to sell it, you can't eat it. So it, it failed. So they, but they were there. So they started subsistence farming. So we sat down with the communities, we brought in NGOs, what could we work here? We looked at the local you know, markets themselves. What can the markets abs absorb? So there's no point in creating a whole bunch of things that you grow and then they're grown in a village five kilometers away and then you're interfering with their market and then they're upset with you. So we spent a lot of time on this and um, we also asked them to put skin in the game here. And um, so it wasn't just a freebie for everybody. When we started Market Gardens, you know, they had to contribute to it by a by purchasing certain things or, or giving us a part of their their labor in terms of the, the front end. So they were part of it as well. And these market gardens have grown. We've developed stuff like spice growing now that that we we get a very, very high price for uh, sesame seeds. Um, one of the things that that I've been involved with, which, I, which I'm extremely proud of the team is a lot of the area, you know, they denude it for, for, for perfectly good reasons, for firewood, for cooking, for heating, everything else. But of course, it causes soil erosion and then they lose the land. And, the, you know, so we developed it, you know, a technique that, or we brought in a technique that had been developed for the Sahara. That's actually one of the, one of these prizes for, um, for farm, farm uh, culture. We've, and we started that. We, we've now planted corn. We're into our second season here. High yield of land that they had just basically thought was gone. We brought in NGOs for water. We put in water um, uh, pumps. The water table is not deep here, maybe 10 to 20 meters. But these villagers can't afford pumps and things like that. And it's, it's dangerous to dig these wells. They, you know, you can fall in, people can die. So we put wells in place. Um, we've now, you know, bit by bit, we started with hand pumps. Now they're solar run, you know, because they're making money in the market garden. So they're buying solar panels, they're pumping water, expanding. Their, so it, the business starts to work and work well. And one final thing we did was we looked at the skill sets that we would need. There's no point in tra saying that, OK, you're going to bring uh, villagers and they're going to become metallurgists or geologists or whatever. What skill sets do we need that are meaningful and long term for these people? And so right off the bat, you know, building, bricklaying, welding, you know, that type of thing, uh, you know, uh, installation of equipment. Um, so we've trained them and they saw it right away. When we built these villages, the hiring was local. So they built their own villages. So not only did they get money from it, they're able to, to look around and go, I did that. I, you know, I was taught, I went to the, to the, to the technical school that we set up. I learned the building techniques and I built these houses and boy, you cannot buy that. That's something that's, you know, the pride of building your own 
township. And this is 1,100 houses. This is not a, a small enterprise. That's created a lot of goodwill. And that's fantastic. I, I, it's something that we look for because we th- we we've been we've had conversations recently, and we were talking to a guy. There's a book behind me. A guy, Professor Alex Edmonds, he talks about companies' purpose. And most people say the purpose of a company is to make money. And he said, well, the purpose of a company is to make money, but it should also be to do good for society. And mm-hmm. um, this is a case in point where you can do both. You can do both. Look, look the, the fundamental issue is this. These people were living here. Okay, yes, we, through te- techniques or whatever, identified that there was a potential mining deposit here. But at the end of the day, they live there. They've worked there. Mm. Their families are there. So think about it. Think about if that was your backyard, would you just be happy if things weren't done? It? No. So you, you must ensure that you go about this the right way. I've walked away from projects where I would go, look, I can't, there's no way this is gonna work, that these people aren't gonna support this. It's going to have a, a, you know, generally a negative effect on them. Like, let's move on. But if you do it right and you sit down and you make sure and and make sure you can do things, don't promise people something you can't do. Do it, hmm. or do, or if there's something that you that's not uh, preventing you from doing something, communicate it right away. Sit down with them and go, look, guys, this is not going to happen this year, and here's why. Look, when I came on board. I, you know, they were expecting the mine to be built because the, the previous management looked as if they had a permit for 2015. I said, this is not going to happen. I am not here to tell you I'm going to start building a mine. That's not going to happen. But we spent time on the ground. I was there probably once every two months. The team were very active on the ground. And we got the trust of the people that we were trying our best and we were doing uh, what needed to be done. And one thing I want to say here as well, everybody locally, they, they get the, you know, they're, they're on Wi-Fi, they're on Instagram, they're on whatever, all this, the local youth. We as senior management here, at we took a 20% pay, voluntary pay cut. They saw that. It's to say, look, okay, we shut it down because of COVID, but we'll take some of the pain as well. And then, you know, that again buys you a lot of credibility with these people. That's fantastic. I mean, we had done our homework. We had done a lot of uh, work on this one. Um, we think the numbers look great. I think you're at that point where potentially if the cost of your money for the CapEx, which is fairly low CapEx, quite frankly, mm-hmm. on a project where you've solved it technically, if you can get that money at the right rate, I think that this is a very interesting project for people to look at. So I haven't given you a hard time over the investment. Uh, I just wanted to understand, you know, how you put it together. And obviously, when I saw this, you know, what you're doing in the community component, I, you know, just thought it was a very good example of how to do it right, deliver for investors, but also do things properly, you know, on, on the on the ground. So, um, look, I appreciate your time today. That's been a, a great run through. I can't believe it's nearly a year since we spoke, because um, things have you've moved things along extremely nicely. Um, are you, are you yeah. pleased? Could it have gone better? Yeah. Any mistakes along yeah, the way, I mean, Paddy? Obviously, if COVID hadn't have happened, we'd be building right now. I mean, that would be the case. I mean, you know, I I can't it's something out of my control. But look. Um, we are at an incredible uh, entry value entry point uh, in this in this cycle. We're trading at about uh, 0.3 nab. I mean, yeah. generally when you're built, you're trading 0. 0.6, 0. 0.7 nab. It's a simple project. It's not 300 million of capex that we have to go out find money somewhere. We have done that. So look, yes, I'm very pleased with with uh, how uh, we as the team have, have uh, you know executed. Um, obviously, we, we would like to be building today, but we will be building soon. And um, I think the value will be seen at that point. And I think the executions, you know, in, in West Africa, in terms of building and running a mine, it's, it's well known now. It's not something that people have to go, oh, well, how will that work? It's well known. There's 14 mines in Burkina. We'll be the 15th. You know, that's the size of Colorado. I mean, that's, you know, it speaks volumes, in my opinion. And we're really looking forward to getting back at it again, to be quite frank. Good on you. 
Paddy, nice okay. to catch up. We should speak uh, a bit more regularly. Let us know. Yes. I think what, like I say, the, the thing I'm keenest to hear is, okay, harmonized term sheet, one thing, but they've got to get in country, take a look on the ground of what's going on, and you've got to agree terms. Um, and the cost of that money, I think, is the, the only, the missing piece for me at the moment. The cost of that money, I can tell you, will be something around 8%. Okay, you take that. You take that. Yeah, absolutely. And we, we, we consciously did that. I mean, you know, it's cheaper than the debt funds. The banks are more difficult to, to bring on board. But um, French banks know West Africa. And we've done it all to IFC standards. So, uh, you know, that's really, really important from our point of view as well. So uh, it was it's worth the time and effort to do it that way, in my opinion.